Okay, yeah, welcome to, to the second lecture on applications on clocks. Uh, I will continue where I stopped uh, yesterday. Uh, I'm still a bit in the, in the first block of the, uh, of the uh, uh, structure here. I will start today with the, uh, with the traps uh, uh, and their, their importance for the, for the clocks. Uh, and I will continue today say a little bit about the lasers and about the reference uh, uh, transitions and interactions with fields. Um, the point I stopped yesterday was, was here with this, with this question, how can we uh, think of building a clock that should be precise to, uh, to 10 to the minus 18 or so, um, even if we have a cold atom at, uh, at uh, say, a 1 millikelvin temperature, uh, but the but the velocity, the thermal velocity, if it would be a free atom, would still be over C, would still be in the range three, uh, ten to the minus ten. So that would be that would be a linear Doppler uh, effect or a Doppler broadening. So how could we get rid of this uh, in order to have a clock that has that reaches here ten to the minus uh, in the frequency ten to the minus sixteen or eighteen? And the um, uh, the the concept, the essential concept that is uh, responsible. Uh, is the confinement of the ion in the so-called Lambdicke regime. So I'm going to explain briefly this, uh, this paper by, uh, by Robert Dicke. Uh, so the paper was written only by him, Lamp, as well as Lamp from the, from the Lamp shift. Uh, he also added to this idea, but it's not a, co not a co author of this paper. But this paper really nicely uh, summarizes the physics of the idea. So the, the what he studied here is just the uh, particle in a box. Uh, in, in a square potential particle moving in, moving inside the box, <coughs> and then he calculated quantum mechanically the uh, emitting or absorbing spectrum of this uh, of this atom. And now the calculation here. <laughs> Sorry about this again. Uh, now the calculation is uh, uh, done for different sizes of the box, decreasing from the bottom to the top. Here in the, in the lowest uh, graph, the box is 25 over 2 times uh, lambda, the wavelength of the light. And uh, the physical situation is very simple. So the, the, the particle is moving freely. It is uh, emitting or uh, absorbing the light. There is a Doppler uh, shift with a certain frequency, V over C. Uh, and the particle is doing this as long at, until it hits the wall. And then it is reflected and moves the other way. So the spectrum. Uh, just consists of, uh, it's like a one-dimensional picture, the, the spectrum just consists of two components with plus V over C and minus V over C mm -hmm. uh, velocity shi uh, Doppler shifts in the two directions. And then you see it's not only, it's not only the two lines, but there is also side features here. Mm -hmm. These are like side bands on these, and uh, they are just basically uh, measuring the frequency of the, of the collisions. Uh, to the to the wall, so if, if it the, the collision happens more frequently, mm -hmm. then this uh, um, the side bands would be spaced at a, at a bigger distance. So again, this is a function of the velocity and the size of the box. And now, uh, imagine being the box shrinking, made smaller, five half uh, five over two lambda. You can see the 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 main line stay where they are, but the <coughs> side bands are moving away because the box is smaller and so the, the collision frequency of hitting the wall is, uh, is becomes more frequent. Still smaller, three, uh, 3 over 2 lambda, similar situation. So the two lines are staying there, side bands are moving away, but now we have a small peak in the center at the, at the zero frequency. And now look what's happened when the box is smaller than lambda, uh, so now the box is only one half lambda, and you see now this feature in the center is dominant uh, and these other features are still there, but now we have a, a, a line right in the center at v equals zero. So the, uh, in this picture, the, uh, the atom is no longer possible to, to move like over, like more over, over one lambda. And you may s s think a little bit of, of it in this sense that, the, with, that while uh, absorbing or emitting the radiation, the, the atom is no longer uh, going over several oscillations of the field, so it cannot really probe the Doppler field. It is confined to the, uh, to the, to the size smaller than lambda, and most of the absorption and emission power is now in the carrier. And that's great. That's what we would, what, that would, what we would like for the clock. We have the line at nu equals zero 
uh, and the Doppler shift, the information about the Doppler is just <coughs> in the sidebands. I've indicated here already, I called it Doppler and recoil free line, and I will explain uh, uh, why this is. So this lamp dicker regime, I'm going to write it down. This is one of the take home messages of, of today. Um. <coughs> so the, I call it, Delta X, the localization of the particle is restricted to a range that's much smaller than the, than the wavelength uh, lambda. So uh, first I, I would like to explain how do we obtain this. Uh, uh, of course, uh, building a, a box at a sub-wavelength size in the optical is not practical. You will have no space to trap atoms. Uh, but uh, one can just use a, a, a conservative potential and combine it with, with cooling. And then you have the simple uh, phenomenon that if you have an initial uncertainty in both the energy and in the position in this conservative, say, harmonic <coughs> potential after cooling, cooling will reduce both the energy uncertainty and it will also compress uh, <coughs> the sample. So cooling, no matter the, the potential, may be extended over much more than the wavelengths, but cooling the particle to the lower region of the potential will eventually get uh, one into the lambda regime. Um, Right. Oh, here I should have talked to uh, to Elaine. I did not meet her. Was, uh, but you can tell me in the in the cooling lectures was there uh, was sideband cooling uh, touched? Okay. Then I should then I should briefly then I should briefly explain it. Um, this is the the type of cooling that is adequate for this uh, uh, for this regime. It is a very simple uh, laser cooling method and a very efficient uh, laser cooling method. Um, it is uh, applicable to the regime of, say, uh, of a, a harmonic trap and to the regime where the, where the transition that is being studied here uh, has a line width that is smaller than the, than the vibrational frequency, than the spacing between the vibrational levels. People call it the strong binding regime. And I need to apologize because now I changed symbols, but I've marked them here. So capital gamma, I now call the, the here, I call the transition line width, and, and capital omega, the um, the trap frequency. So the uh, the uh, the radiation that drives uh, he, uh, that drives the the atom from the ground state to the excited state can be narrower than the than the spacing of the levels. And in this situation, you have like a like a scattering situation from a molecule. There is an harmonic uh, oscillator spectrum. So each the, the ground state and the excited state both have a ladder of equidistantly spaced levels, which are the vibrational excitation in this harmonic potential. Again, the spectrum, the absorption and the emission spectrum look like this. They will consist of a, of a carrier, which in this case now is the, uh, say, let's speak about the absorption spectrum, which would be the absorption where the quantum number is not changed. So going from vibrational state N in the ground state to N in the excited state. And this corresponds just to the, to the atomic frequency. And then there are sidebands, and the sidebands are spaced now, of course, by the, by the vibrational frequencies, where, for example, this lower sideband here corresponds to a situation where the, in, where the absorption is driving the atom from a state n, vibrational state n, to a state n minus 1. The frequency is just lower by one vibrational <coughs> quantum. And now you, and this is everything one needs for the cooling. Now you can, you, now you can see what happens. Uh, if the laser is tuned to this red sideband, it will drive the, the atom uh, from, from this uh, state, reducing the vibrational number by one. And then we just wait for the, uh, for the spontaneous emission. And the spontaneous emission will happen, of course, in a, um, in a random fashion. But when the particle is sufficiently confined already, it has the highest probability of happening on the carrier. And happening on the carrier, it means that during the emission, the particle does not change uh, its vibrational quantum number anymore. So it means that in one such uh, absorption emission cycle, the particle has reduced, is in the ground state again, but has reduced its vibrational excitation by one unit. And, uh, and now this may re be repeated over and over again. And f eventually, finally, one ends up in the, in the ground state. So it is, it is allowing uh, to cool the, the particles to the, to the ground state of the harmonic trap. One can calculate, uh, there is again some cooling limit. One can calculate this in terms of the mean oscillator quantum number, uh, n. 
it is determined uh, by, by factors like non-resonant excitation. So, so one would continue the cooling here on the red sideband, mm -hmm. but when the particle is more and more localized, the red sideband will become weaker and weaker. Uh, but still there may be, uh, so the absorption will become weaker, but still, so at this case, for example, what may happen is that the laser non-resonantly drives the, the carrier instead of the sideband. And so this will be a process that will just lead to some kind of diffusion and will not further <laughs> lower the energy. And so this determines the, the, the limit. So the, the limiting quantum number here is given by the ratio, simply by the ratio <coughs> of the line width of the transition to the, to the trap frequency. We have assumed in the beginning that, uh, that this ratio is smaller than one, so, we, so this number will be smaller than one. It means we can approach uh, the ground state. And uh, this has been first demonstrated with, uh, with trapped ions. It's easier with trapped ions because there the oscillation frequencies can easily be made higher, megahertz range or so, and so it's easy to fulfill uh, this criterion. And the very first um, experiment that, uh, that did this actually was um, uh, a, a <coughs> like a clock experiment with a, with a trapped ion. So here it was mercury plus. Uh, here you see the level scheme. Uh, there is a w an allowed transition, a cooling, uh, Doppler cooling transition, S to P. And here is a narrow transition, S to D, which should be used for the, for the clock eventually. But here they used it to demonstrate, it's a group of Dave Wineland in, uh, at NIST in Boulder, and here they used it to demonstrate the sideband cooling. In order to speed the process up a little bit, they, there was an additional repumper that brings the iron from the excited state that otherwise would live, I don't know, a few 10 milliseconds, there was an additional repumper to bring it back. And then you see the, and then you see the result here a nice, after Doppler cooling, a nice spectrum already in the, in the lamp Dicker regime, a dominant carrier and two sidebands. And then after, uh, after cooling, approaching the, the, the ground state, you see a further reduction of the sidebands. And now I'm missing one, I'm missing one uh, aspect that I should explain maybe in, uh, maybe in this picture, yeah. Um, so once the ground state is approached, of course, uh, the red sideband will go away completely because the red sideband in, in the absorption spectrum, because the red sideband would try to, ex to excite from the ground state to the n minus one state, which of course does not exist. And so this is symmetry. There's an asymmetry in the between the lower and the higher frequency sideband. And this asymmetry is directly related to the average quantum number. And so it's uh, for here they analyze this that it is 0.05 uh, uh, oscillator quantum number. Okay, we are, we are in the lamp Dicker regime. We have sidebands much smaller than the carrier, and we have even cold, uh, cooled the iron to the, um, to the ground state. And um, to, uh, to do a little bit of, of a quantitative uh, analysis, uh, we, we need to look a little bit at the strengths of these, uh, of these sidebands. Uh, let's first do it in a, in a classical uh, situation, say that say it is a classical harmonical oscillator that is moving in a harmonic uh, spectrum, then both the absorption and emission spectrum will be frequency modulated by the, by the Doppler effect, uh, and this is from frequency modulation. Um, this is, you can look it up in radio engineering and wherever. So this can be the, the sideband, the strength of the sideband is described by a modulation index, which is the product of the oscillation amplitude x and the wave vector of the, of the radiation. And this then enters into the argument of Bessel's functions, j, j l square, and the index of the Bessel function indicates uh, the order of the sideband. So uh, so S equals zero would correspond to the carrier, S equals plus one, the first sideband, plus two, the second sideband, and so on. Classical uh, reasoning, uh, you can also see now the lamp Dicke condition. Here it's written again, Kx, similar, uh, equivalent to this, Kx smaller than one, uh, of course means, you know, the, you know, the Bessel function, so if the, if the, if the, um, if the argument of the Bessel function is small, then, s then only the lower order Bessel functions will contribute. So if it's much smaller than one, then basically just the zero will, com will contribute, which is a carrier. So in the, in the lamp Dicke condition, carrier dominance. 
going to into a quantum, it becomes a bit more uh, more complicated, and I'm, and I'm just showing the results here. Uh, so the um, um, the modulation index can now be can now be written as as k times the uh, size of the uh, oscillator wave function, which is uh, the ground state wave function a zero <coughs> multiplied by square root uh, two n plus one. And in the Lambdicke condition, now one finds with a relatively simple uh, quantum mechanical calculation, <coughs> this is symmetry that now the um, now sorry, um, this is for the emission spectrum now, that, that one sideband, in this case in the emission, the plus one is proportional to n, and the other one is proportional to n plus one. So it means that going to the ground state, one sideband uh, vanishes and the other stays, and from the ratio of the two, one can directly determine the, um, the mean quantum number. And of course, it is different, so in the in the absorption spectrum, the red sideband vanishes, and in the emission spectrum, it's the other way around, the blue sideband will, will vanish, because in the emission spectrum, we start here in the ground state, and then it cannot go to the to minus one, and so the blue sideband would vanish. Um, and now come, and now we are also prepared for, to understand very easily this, this aspect of the, of the recoil-free uh, condition of the, of the carrier, um, with recoil free, I mean that uh, that the position of the line is not only free from the Doppler effect, it's also free from the recoil effect. So the the, the, the recoil effect would, would mean that the, the the atom, the free atom absorbing um, a photon, <coughs> will change its momentum. It will also change the energy due to the its kinetic energy due to the due to the recoil. And this kinetic energy, of course, has to be supplied by the by the photon. So if you look carefully in the spectrum. It would appear like a little shift of the line uh, given by, by the recoil energy. And this effect, which also would not be nice for the, for the clock because it, uh, it, would depend, yeah, it would depend on the atomic mass and, and, and things, uh, and on the trap frequency, is absent in the Lambdicke criterion because uh, if we write uh, the Lambdicke condition for the, uh, for the ground state uh, here, so the ground state extension smaller than lambda over 2 pi, now some very simple uh, manipulation. We re we replace lambda by k. We we square this equation, and then we add and then we see that we uh, that we find from this equivalent to this inequality, we find this inequality, which also you may recognize immediately. It says that the oscillator quantum that the oscillator energy quantum is bigger than h bar k squared over two m, which is the recoil energy for the two for the three particles. So it means the Lambdicke uh, condition here is is equivalent to saying that the that the single photon recoil energy is smaller than the vibrational energy, and it means that the that the recoil energy is just not sufficient to excite the particle by a full vibrational excitation, <laughs> and that means that most of the of the scattering processes will be uh, will be elastic. So the the uh, absorption and re-emission will will happen like if the photon is hitting a hard a hard wall, there will be no momentum exchange. And uh, this is spectroscopically a nice, a nice feature uh, because, yeah, it, it, it eliminates the shift of the, of the clock frequency. Uh, this term, recoil-free, you may have heard it already also in nuclear <coughs> physics when people explain, speak about Mussbauer spectroscopy. This is the, this is a, the very high resolution gamma spectroscopy, the emitting uh, nucleus is bound in a crystal lattice and the binding is so strong that the recoil from the gamma photon is not transferred to the individual nucleus, but roughly speaking to the whole uh, lattice, and then the, it looks like it is an elastic scattering and there is no shift. Yes? Um, is elastic scattering that still um, covers changes of direction of the momentum? Um, there, is th there, there, there would be an, an, uh, an Random change of, uh, of of the direction. So so elastic, right? Elastic in this case the sense does not mean that the uh, that that there is a fixed angle or so relation between the incoming and the outgoing photon. The the incoming photon direction is of course determined by the laser, mm -hmm. and the outgoing may be symmetric, just depending on the on the wave function uh, on the emission pattern of the atom. 
it, it, it sounds a little bit like uh, it, it, it may sound a little bit like cheating, like like somehow momentum conservation would be violated here. Um, but it's not. Or it is. It is now. A, you, one has to consider really as as a quantum um, as a as a quantum uh, random process. Of course. Uh, if the if the that the recoil energy is smaller, mm. does not mean that it is completely uh, uh, forbidden. So from from uncertainty, mm. one may imagine that a few s that in a few instances, um, just by scattering on the or, or, uh, or scattering absorbing on the carrier, mm. uh, the uh, the atom may now emit. Uh, towards the first excited state, and in this case, there has been an energy transfer has taken has taken place. Energy has been has been taken away from the photon field and has been added to the kinetic energy. But it's just that such a process will not happen will only happen rarely, and it will in the spectrum it will it will show up as a sideband. So so basically spectroscopically, we can dis we can discriminate between the processes where the scattering was purely elastic on the carrier and the, and the scattering event where an energy has been <laughs> transferred to the atom. Also from, from the consideration of the sidebands, I, 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 yeah, I, I explained already, the, the overall spectrum in the quantum regime is asymmetric. So in the, in the absorption spectrum, the the red sideband goes away, and in the emission spectrum, the blue sideband goes away, and it means that if you overlay the two, uh, they are not <laughs> identical, and uh, and if you would look for the envelope of the thing, there would be a shift between the uh, between the absorption and the emission spectrum, and this shift just corresponds to an average energy transfer that happens from these random uh, excitations. Um, so energy and momentum conservation, everything is everything is nicely fulfilled, but just for the bound particle, and the resolved spectrum that the sidebands are resolved uh, allows to discriminate or to to look only at those events where the kinetic energy is not changed. Okay, now this is um, now we have the uh, now we have all the concepts I think for 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 knowing how the uh, how the uh, optical clock uh, looks like. And uh, now this shows a little bit, summarizes a little bit the, uh, the, the, the other elements. So I've, uh, I've spoken about the, uh, about the atomic reference, uh, which is now, which is a laser-cooled atom or ion, a narrow transition in it. And in order to, summar to, to set up technically the clock, we need the oscillator, uh, which is a n very narrow <laughs> laser oscillator. It is uh, stabilized to the atomic resonance. It has some short-term uh, stabilization, some short-term, it needs some short-term flywheel, and there is this clockwork uh, that is uh, used to provide output at a radio frequency or at a, at a time scale where you can count the frequencies in the microwave, not in the optical. Um, to give you a feeling, I will, uh, I will not go very much in into the technical details. I will more stay on the, on the atomic side. But, but to give you a feeling, I will, I will say now, what is it? Uh, I'm, I mixed up my, <laughs> my schedule. Uh, okay, no, I should say, right. I should, I should first stay here on the, uh, on, the, uh, um, on the atomic reference side, and then I will uh, speak a little bit about how to get such a stable <coughs> laser. Uh, so the, the traps, I've now speaking for about the traps on a generic uh, way. I've just drawn the harmonic potential. Um, two systems are used for traps, and they are uh, optical dipole traps, optical lattices for neutral atoms. Uh, I think you've uh, heard quite a lot here already about it, and you are quite familiar with it. Just here, the two-dimensional situation <coughs> with, uh, with the two-dimensional lattice. Um, I think I'm maybe the only speaker here speaking about ion traps, and so I should, uh, since they are quite important for the uh, for the clocks, I will I will briefly explain it. Uh, that that of course ions, you have the electrical charge, you can exert electrical forces. They are much stronger than the dipole forces, and so one can really uh, make a very deep trap, uh, easily fulfilling the Lambdicke criterion with trapped uh, ions. And both systems are investigated by uh, as candidates for uh, for optical clocks. First, just a few th things about the 
about the neutral atoms. Uh, it is the, the traps working, of course, based on the on the light shifts. It has been discussed here uh, yesterday by uh, by Anton, for example. Uh, there is a red detuned uh, lattice. It will it will lower the ground state. It may it may trap there. But the, the problem, if you have uh, if you have neutral atoms, the trap can only work by shifting the energy levels. You have no other. There is no other uh, way of exerting a force on the atom. One always has to somehow act on the internal structure. And this is for the clock. You would say, ah, this is not what you like because we would like to measure the unperturbed frequency. And so for a for a two-level atom. Lowering the ground state would mean, by, by the dipole force, would mean lifting the excited state and the, and the transition frequencies would change. But we are not working with a, with a two-level atom. So if this is a, the reference transition of the clock, one may look for a, for a situation where the dipole trapping field displaces the ground state exactly by the identical amount like the excited state. And this may happen if the same retitude laser, for example, couples somewhere between the excited state the upper state of the of the reference transition, and some other levels, and displaces the state by the same amount. Then the trap would the trap potential would look identical for ground state and excited state, and the transition frequency would not be uh, shifted. This idea, this insight, was first uh, pronounced by by Hidetoshi Katori in um, in about 2000. Um, he was working at the uh, also on iron traps, and he thought, ah, iron traps is a nice system for optical clocks, and how can we also do an, an a similar and equivalent for an iron trap with a neutral? And then he, he made this proposal. He called it the magic wavelengths. Uh, mm -hmm. It is uh, of, the, of the dipole trap, and it's quite natural. It, it's, not, it's not uncommon here. One example is the strontium, uh, the strontium atom. So the reference transition here is the one connecting the ground state. Uh, to this uh, triplet P0 level, um, and here is plotted as a function of the wavelengths of the of the trapping of the dipole light, the the light shift. Um, the the red curve is for the is for <coughs> the ground state. The ground state is mainly it has one strong resonance here in the blue 460 nanometer. It's, it's slightly off the scale, so you see the the, the curve here is just bending down towards a strong resonance somewhere here. For the excited state here, it's a bit more, there is some other lines here not depicted here. There are some lines in the infrared and so on. Each of these resonances pr provides such a dispersive shaped uh, uh, change of the, uh, of the light shift. And so you see it's not uncommon that there is a crossing between the two, between the two lines. In this case here, it is, at a, it is at a convenient wavelength, 800 nanometers, uh, where it's convenient to set up lasers. Some in many atoms, there is even more than one such crossings, and there is a choice of different magic wavelengths. And now this works. Here you can see a, a clear experimental proof of it. So here the, uh, the light shift is measured as a, as a function of the depth of the lattice. This is results from the uh, Surte group in, in, group in Paris, strontium. Uh, so they varied the change, the, the depth of the lattice, and measured the light shift on, on the reference transition for different wavelengths of the, of the lattice light around these 813 nanometers magic wavelengths. And then you can see it's quite a sensitive experiment. So changing the, changing the, uh, the wavelengths of the lattice light here in the first or second digit um, quite significantly changes the slope, and then you can see you come to the range where the slope becomes flat. That is where the light shift is eliminated, and no longer depending on the, on the depth of the lattice, and that's a magic frequency. So that's, that's the, basic, uh, the basis be behind the traps for the, for the neutral atoms. Some more results here on the spectroscopy, then now it's, now it's, it's shown as spectrum. Mm -hmm. You can see the carrier, you can see the sidebands. Um, this is from an ethereum. Lattice clock is all one-dimensional lattices, uh, so uh, there is um, uh, it is a focused, uh, mildly focused one-dimensional beam. The potential looks like a sequence of, of, of pancakes where the atoms are, are trapped. And in, in this case, it's not single occupancy, but in each of these maxima, light maxima, there is a few atoms. And uh, 
this produces this means that the that the sideband frequencies along this motion are not exactly the same for all the atoms. So if the atom is sitting close to the axis, uh, the, the oscillation frequency is a bit higher than if the atom is somewhere out in the wings, or if the also if the atom is located here, frequency is a bit higher than if it's here. This leads to the situation that the sidebands do not look as nice anymore. They are, they are smeared out uh, because the vibrational frequency is not completely fixed. But for the carrier, it does not, it does not matter. This, the carrier itself is not influenced by the exact value of the sideband frequency, so the carrier has a minimum line which and it is, it is unperturbed. This is a situation from a, uh, from a different experiment. Right here it's strontium. Here the carrier is very strongly saturated, and you see again the sideband cooling uh, picture like I've shown you for the single ion. Here it's now with many atoms again, sideband cooling uh, reduction of the red sideband relative to the uh, to the blue one. We go to the ions, um, and I should uh, briefly explain ion trapping. I, th I think many of you have uh, have known about uh, know about the power trap. Uh, I give uh, I give a summary, it, uh, a brief summary of it. The ideas are old, so uh, they they go back to the 50s to the <coughs> 70s. Uh, these these three people shared the Nobel Prize, the Physics Nobel Prize, in 1989. Uh, it is Norman Ramsey uh, for the Ramsey method for the cesium clocks, for all the other clocks. And they shared the prize with Wolfgang Paul, the inventor of these Paul iron trap, and Hans Demelt, who made the visionary uh, proposals for the trapped iron optical clocks. He made these proposals as early as about 1975, knowing about, he proposed laser cooling, uh, he, uh, of the bound, the sideband cooling was his proposal, <laughs> together with Dave Wineland, and he proposed this uh, spectroscopy of single ions of very narrow transitions and that used for the clock. And most remarkable, in, the, in his first papers, he wrote 10 to the minus 18 will be the uncertainty of, of the clock. Uh, <laughs> that was at the time when the, others, when the other clocks were 10 to the minus 12 or so. So he was really far ahead of his, of his time. And some people, he was also a special, uh, kind of a special character uh, and not really mainstream in the physics, but highly creative. And, uh, and really, he was really very correct with his, with his proposal. <laughs> So the idea is to combine the lambda confinement in an ion trap and that the electrical forces on the ion just produce negligible level shifts. Use laser cooling, and then one has these benefits of basically an unlimited interaction time, mm -hmm. uh, a very clean environment. The trap is, is housed in an, in an ultra vacuum. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you have a very low pressure, there is even no collisions. Uh, so very nicely suited for, for long interaction times, for well-controlled interactions, and so on. He had done experiments, Demet had done experiments before on measuring the g-factors of, of single electrons and positrons. And so he knew that, that even without laser cooling, he could trap an electron or a positron for like weeks and months in a, in a, in a trap. And uh, that's what, what gave him the confidence and the idea that this could be done with, uh, with atoms. The Paul trap, an electric trap, uh, it's an electric dynamic trap. There is in, this in, the, uh, in the normal, in the standard configuration, it's three electrodes. It's a quadrupole, it's a ring electrode, and two end caps. Uh, if a static potential is applied between these two electrodes, one creates for a charged particle a saddle potential. The particle will either be, if, if there is positive voltage on the ring, a positive ion, it will be repelled by the ring, but attracted to the end cap. So it is stable in one direction and stable in the other. Uh, unstable in the other. You cannot do anything better with static fields. There is, there is Poisson's equation. It will always be uh, two polarities. Particles will always be unstable. But this was Wolfgang Powell's insight from 1955. Switching the polarity quickly uh, leads to an emotion in a, in a time-dependent potential <coughs> that is governed by, by, ma by a Maskew equation uh, that is written here, a simple second-order differential equation. Um, it has one driving term and one constant term that would be a DC voltage. And then, depending on these parameters, A and Q, uh, the, the motion of a particle in this potential has stable and unstable solutions. 
and this has been well studied in, in, in mathematics, when people draw an, a stability diagram depending on these A and Q factors, A related to the DC potential, Q related to the, to the AC potential, and if one stays inside this regime, then the particle trapping um, is, uh, is stable. Uh, the way to, to look at this hand waving is shown here. I hope that it I can activate my no I can activate this animation. You see the time dependent uh, uh, potential. The particle is of course always trying to roll uh, to roll downhill. But basically inertia um, prevents it from uh, from falling down because the polarity uh, is changing. It has to change at the right frequency and the right amplitude, and then a stable confinement is, uh, is produced. The picture, it is the same picture of a, of, of a parametric drive that's also applicable for the, for the uh, uh, optical dipole trap. It's just uh, a retitune drive of, of a resonance. Here it's also a retitune drive of the, of the periodic potential uh, with the for the motion of the free particle. Um, this is how the trajectories look like. Uh, pictures taken not with atoms but with dust particles. Uh, people ne nearly at the same time at, uh, as, as, uh, as Powell's. They did it with dust particles. And you can see single particle. Uh, here you can see it's a long-term um, photograph. You can see the so-called superposition of a large motion. This is what you also saw on the, on the previous animation. And superposed is what is called micro motion. This is a motion at the frequency of the, uh, of the driving potential. And uh, so it looks like a complicated motion, and it means uh, this is not necessarily what you want to have. You want the point-like localization, but if the particle is cooled, if the particle is closer to the saddle point, uh, then this micro-motion amplitude will go away. You can see this very clearly here. If there is many particles uh, trapped at the same time, they will repel each other uh, just by the Coulomb interaction. And so the particles that, because of the repulsion, are sitting outside, they will see the stronger field uh, strength. They will do this micro motion, so they appear here as a line. But the particles that happen to sit close to the center, they see the small field strength, and they are not moving. And that is, here you can see the reason immediately why this should work as a single particle clock. If you have many particles, you will have this. And the outer particles, of course, will have large field shifts, large Doppler motion. But the single particle in the center uh, will, be, uh, will be unperturbed. <coughs> this is some, some pictures of how these traps are looking uh, like um, the um, classical version, a ring electrode and two end caps. It's about a millimeter size. Um, and the particle, the single ion, can be held in the center. Here we, we were trapping a terbium. It is evaporated, a little bit of metal from an oven. It can be ionized by impact with electrons. And then, fortunately, again, this particle stays there for weeks and months. And, uh, and uh, you don't have to run. Th that's why you can take a very simple oven at a very simple electron source. More modern traps look, look more like this. They are geometrically more open. There is linear traps. Here you can see a whole zoo of uh, of uh, electrode configurations that all generate like a, uh, like a quadrupole potential, time-dependent quadrupole potential will always uh, create a confinement of the ion. Linear uh, configuration can be used as a mass spectrometer. That, that is actually the, the, the dominant application that, that Paul himself thought about. The, the stability condition for the particle is depending on the on the frequency and on the mass on, on the e over m of the of the particle mm -hmm. so it can act in transmission it can act like a mass filter and that is that is the most important commercial application of of, of this system uh, but th in the 3d version then we can trap the particles it can now be done chip scale like with all the electrodes in one in one plane uh, a wide variety of, of, uh, of geometries. This is the geometry that's most popular now for the single ion experiment. Here, basically, the ring electrode is replaced by these two outer cylinders and, and retracted from the central plane. And so, you, and so it means that the, that the particle, the single ion, is really suspended in a region that's very free. So you have 
you have free access, optical access from two pi around it and over a wide range. This is a, uh, we call it NCAP <coughs> trap, the most uh, popular single ion trap. This is this one here. Okay, now we have to understand another uh, elementary concept of how to do, we can s we see we can trap a single ion very well. How do we do perf uh, spectroscopy of a single ion? This was again demoed in the, in the 50s, 50s, 70s, uh, sorry, um, proposing these, he called it electron shelving or observation of quantum jumps, it's called sometimes, very simple idea. An atomic level scheme, a ground state, uh, a, an allowed transition that's used for the laser cooling and the fluorescence detection and the reference transition to the of the clock. It goes to a metastable long lived state uh, and say uh, that this is a state, say, of one second lifetime, this is a state of, of a nanosecond lifetime. Mm -hmm. if, if, if both transitions are driven simultaneously with two lasers, the fluorescence signal that one will obtain is, is shown here. It's an er experimental signal. Uh, the ion has a choice, basically. It can scatter photons on, on, on this transition. You will see a fluorescence light. Or the ion is excited to this metastable state, and then the electron will be sitting there for the lifetime of the state, like for one second. And the valence electron is not available for for producing fluorescence on this transition, so the ion will turn dark. You see a really a macroscopic dark period in the single ion fluorescence. People called it one observing quantum jumps to the metastable state, and when it decays back, oops, the fluorescence appears again. It is a very elementary quantum uh, phenomenon, first observed in the 80s or so, and r really was uh, created a lot of interest at the time. And it is, it is an extremely efficient quantum amplification mechanism because mm. the absorption of one photon here on this, for on this clock transition stops the uh, scattering of, say, a million or a few million photons on the, clock on, the, on the cooling transition. So even with a modest detection uh, uh, efficiency, one can all of the, of the single photon here, mm. one can always, with very high probability, register these dark periods, and they are the reference for the clock because they indicate that the clock transition has been excited. So this is uh, here <coughs> some data of how it looks, uh, of how this uh, looks in the laboratory. I've brought you here some, some quantum noise from the, from the laboratory. Uh, it is ytterbium plus. You see the realistic level scheme. We do not, at this point, we do not need to look at all the details cooling transition, reference transition on the scope. This is signal from a photomultiplier filtered a little bit electrically. Ah, yeah, I should explain here. Mm -hmm. The sequence here, we are not applying the, the both lasers at the same time, but we are applying the, the cooling laser for some time to cool the iron down, mm -hmm. to prepare it in the hyperfine ground state as, the, as a lower level of the clock transition. Then we switch the cooling laser off this is what happens here during this phase. No, sorry, it happens in this phase. Uh, then we apply the, the probe laser that's driving the clock laser that drives the forbidden transition, and then the cooling laser is turned on again, and, uh, and in the very first, like, 5 to 10 milliseconds, uh, the observation is done, do we see fluorescence or not, and this is the result, was the ion in the metastable state or was it in the ground state? It is done like this because for the clock, we do not want to apply the two lasers simultaneously because you know about light shifts. The, uh, the, the cooling laser would, would, of course, produce a bad light shift for the, for the clock. So that's why the lasers are applied alternately. And again, a small animation. Just data filmed from the, from the uh, oscilloscope, and you can see uh, you see long and short, long and short periods of the um, of the fluorescence signal here, corresponding to events where the ion fluoresces immediately. That is where it was in the ground state, and uh, and where it does not fluoresce immediately, where it has to be repumped because it was in the excited state. Although this is noisy, I mean this is single ion, this is single ion fluorescence. It is noisy, but you can see that that. 
the absence or presence during these 10 milliseconds we can detect with very high uh, probability. So, um, so it is a reliable signal. But it means that, um, again, <coughs> I'm still introducing the, 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 the concept, it means that this type of detection is fundamentally limited uh, by, uh, by quantum noise and what, co what people called uh, quantum projection noise. Again, this was work here from the group of Dave Wineland at, uh, at, uh, at NIST working on the, on the single ion clocks. Um, the um, the uh, clock I, I explained yesterday, we the, uh, to, to, to obtain a signal from the clock, we never mm -hmm. tune the laser to the, to the center of the line, but we always, the laser is always tuned to the, to the half maximum of the line, that is where the slope of the, of the spectrum is maximum. And, um, and now this is, imagine this as the, as the excitation spectrum of a, of a, of a single line. Um, it means uh, we have an excitation probability ranging from, mm -hmm. ranging from zero to one. If we would be at the center, we would excite, the ion would be excited each time. Um, but we, we are not measuring here, we are measuring here. And what does it mean? We excite the ion just on the average with 50% probability. So, um, so the outcome of, of one measurement, uh, of one such measurement cycle, we, 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 have, we expect to have a 50% probability of having the ion in the ground state of the excited state, but the quantum jump outcome of the, of the uh, experiment will be either a one uh, excited state or ground state, it will be either one or zero, it's a binary, it's a binary signal. So the measurement sequence is a, is a sequence of, of, of basically a random sequence of binary numbers. We have a 50% uh, excitation probability, and, uh, but we are always measuring zero or one. And the noise in this time sequence can be, can be evaluated, and the variance for n measurements of this is given by this simple expression. It is the product of the excitation probability times one minus the excitation probability times the number of, uh, of atoms. And if the excitation probability is, is 0.5, uh, then this is then this is um, then this is 0 0.25 times one. Mm -hmm. So it means that the, squ the square root of the variance is 0 0.5. So the uh, the signal to noise ratio defined like this is uh, is only one for a, for a single event, mm -hmm. uh, and it looks like a very noisy. Uh, pros process because of what is called this quantum projection noise that the outcome of the single measurement is either zero or one, but we want to measure 0 0.5. But of course the measurement, we do not uh, steer the clock with a single measurement, but, but if as soon as one starts to average, like over three, four measurements, then this, uh, this numbers obtains a significance and one can derive the difference between the lower and upper sideband number and obtain a signal that is, uh, that is useful for steering the clock. But uh, you see it uh, drastically in the single ion experiment that the, this so-called quantum projection noise is the fundamental noise source that is, uh, that is uh, in, the, in all the atomic clocks and it is of course especially drastic uh, for the single ion clocks. Um, and here is, uh, is a few uh, spectra showing how all this physics now goes together into, into spectroscopy, and you can see uh, the effects here quite, uh, quite nicely. This is taken now spectra, uh, again with this ytterbium uh, uh, ion, and uh, spectra on different, on different scales, on different frequency scales, and they show the different physical uh, aspects. Starting here on the one megahertz uh, scale, we see the lambda-like spectrum, the carrier, and we see the sidebands from the uh, of the motion in the trap. It is not here. There was not sideband cooling, but it was Doppler cooling. Uh, so we are not in the ground state, but like in the 15 vibration level. But it's in the lambda uh, limit. <coughs> Frequency resolution is increased, going to the like 50 mega, uh, sorry, 50 kilohertz scale. One sees uh, a splitting of five lines, which is the Zeeman structure of this transition. 
we need to look at the, at the level diagram a little bit. It's an F equals zero ground state and an F equals, this one, the, the blue one, mm -hmm. F equals two excited state. Uh, so the ground state has just one component, the excited state has, has five components, and this is five lines. Mm -hmm. uh, and the zero to zero mm -hmm. is the one that is Zeeman independent, and that's used for the clock, and the others are linear Zeeman dependent. A small field is applied, like one micro Tesla, to just shift these lines away so that the carrier is unperturbed. One zooms in further, now to the 5 kilohertz range, Pi pulse on this on this clock transition one millisecond, uh, nearly hundred percent excitation probability, uh, and uh, Fourier limited line width. It looks. Uh, you look at this and you say, "Oh, oh this lo really looks noisy," mm -hmm. uh, but it is it is mainly quantum noise. So the experiment, uh, each frequency here, we there was twenty cycles of interrogation. So the the result, the number here is a number between zero and 20, depending on the excitation probability. And so uh, 20 plus minus four, still that's a lot of, that's a lot of, of noise that you, can, that you can see here. No, not, not plus four in this case, you will never see more. You will never see, you will never see 24 excitations uh, in, the, in, in 20 events. And then it is just a question of increasing the duration and getting uh, of, the, of the pulse and, uh, and getting narrower lines. So this is the, uh, spectroscopic uh, sing uh, signature of uh, of such a, uh, of such a single ion uh, clock. Um, right now, uh, now I'm basically at the um, at the point where I wanted to speak a little bit about the uh, about the technologies for the for mm -hmm. the lasers. And um, yes, I think I think I should I should do it to give you to give you a feeling of how this is done um, because uh, uh, I've spoken about these these very narrow uh, these very narrow lines like Hertz level resolution uh, there is a important technical requirement behind it the, the oscillator has to be sufficiently stable to drive such a narrow transition but this one needs a laser to start with that on the short time scale has like a one Hertz line width now the line width of the laser is determined basically by the by the resonator structure, by the uh, laser condition, the standing waves inside the cavity, and if one wants to have ten, uh, one hertz, say ten to the minus fifteen of the optical frequency, it means that the laser structure has to maintain a dimensional stability of, of ten to the minus fifteen. So if it's if it's a centimeter or so, the, the the length of the of the cavity has to be stable of ten to the minus fifteen of one centimeter. That's the diameter of the uh, of the proton. Um, smaller, uh, <laughs> so uh, it has to be intrinsically mechanically stable. But it is possible, and I will just briefly uh, go a little bit to, to that aspect. So one one does not use a laser cavity itself, but the laser is uh, is locked to a passive cavity, which is made out of a stable material. It is kept under isolated conditions inside the vacuum, isolated from vibrations, temperature stabilized, and so on. And then this provides via some servo system mm -hmm. the locking that provides the, the signal to, uh, to reduce the laser line widths. And there has been some very important uh, developments in this field recently over the last five years or so that have lead, led to great uh, progress. Um, oops. I did not touch it, it's just a connection here. So the um, um, the the modern version of of, of this resonator uh, looks like this. This is a, a piece of single of, of single crystal silicon, uh, just like I don't know precisely, maybe a four inch or so wafer. So you can get this for relatively uh, cheap money from the as a as a basis from the from the semiconductor industry. Uh, it is an ori but it is an oriented single crystal. Uh, a hole is drilled through it as the optical axis, and then it is machined precisely to this to this dual conical uh, conical shape. Uh, a hole is drilled, and then two highly reflective mirrors are attached as the as the end mirrors to this uh, to this structure. Um, 
and this is a, a single crystal, so it has a very high uh, mechanical stability. It's very rigid, uh, it has very high Q, and so it provides very stable short-term instability. Before, people have been using these uh, glass ceramic spacers here. It's a, it's a nice picture, but uh, this is a, a low expansion material called ultra-low expansion, a glass ceramic, and again, high-quality mirrors uh, um, attached to it as a, as a reference. Uh, but silicon has a nice, um, has a really nice feature. Um, sorry. <coughs> okay. Silicon has a has a nice feature that uh, that if it is cooled to uh, uh, to a cryogenic temperature about 124 Kelvin, that's uh, that's achievable with liquid nitrogen. Mm -hmm. Um, there is a, a zero of the of the coefficient of thermal expansion. So this is the the coefficient of thermal expansion of silicon crystal as a function of the temperature. It reduces in cooling from uh, from several hundred Kelvin. Uh, it goes to zero, of course, at uh, at at, uh, at 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 t equals zero. Uh, but here it does something something funny. So at low temperatures. Uh, the coefficient of expansion is negative, so it actually, if, if starting from zero and and heating it up, it would it would contract the crystal, and then above 124 Kelvin, it uh, it starts to expand, and this means operating at this temperature, one has uh, something that is temperature, rather temperature independent in the length, and so one obtains a very stable uh, reference. So this is some recent experimental results from from work at, uh, at the cooperation of PTB with John Year's group. This was set up at PTB. Two such systems compared each other. And here you see the famous Allen deviation plot of, um, of these two, of the comparison of these two silicon cavities, the measurement time, and the Allen deviation of this, uh, of this frequency difference. And you see this typical picture of an oscillator that's not an atomic clock, so on, on the short time there is, there is noise, then there is a flaw, which is dominated by this flicker thermal noise, and then, of course, it's a cavity in the long run, uh, for a few minutes or hours, it starts to drift. But the interesting feature here is the depth of this, of this flaw, which is thermal uh, noise, as I said. It's in, the, it's in the 10 to the minus 17 range for one to se 10 seconds. So, so it is a, a laser at 1.5 micron with a coherence, sorry, with a coherence time of, of, li of like 10 seconds, which means that a 10 millihertz uh, uh, line width. So you can send this light to the moon and back several times and you, and you have coherent, uh, uh, and you have maintained coherence. Low 10 minus 17, and people are even projecting uh, going to helium temperature and to, and to improved coatings. There is still room for another order of magnitude uh, uh, improvement. But this means now here we are setting in, uh, we can now interrogate atoms with a subhertz line width and then use the atom signal to lock here and to get rid of the, uh, to get rid of the drift. I like to show this as a, as a new uh, as a new development here you, here you can see how it, how, it, how it will go together again the Allen deviation plot so the, the red curve is the one from this from this oscillator and the blue one would be the one the quantum projection noise signal from the from the atom and now taking these two systems together uh, one would choose an interrogation of the atom so that somewhere with the the, the lock can be done to the atom in this range where this plateau of the cavity is, that is between milliseconds and like hundred seconds, and improving on the stability of the oscillator sh means shifting this lower. One can also work on the atomic parameters to shift this line lower, <laughs> which means one could go to longer <laughs> interrogation times, narrower line widths. Please. Um, Yeah, this is uh, this is this is working at the at 1.5 <laughs> uh, at 1.5 micron uh, because uh, this it is transparent. It is a wavelength that silicon is transparent at 1.5 micron, uh, and th if the clock laser, of course, is at a different frequency, so one has to transfer the stability with a frequency comb. 
so uh, from the 1.5 micron it's transferred to the uh, to the to the clock laser and the frequency comb is a tool that provides this transfer of the signal. <coughs> microwave also but you don't necessarily need so so you can all do, do all this in the in the optical with the with a with a with a comb that's referenced to the uh, uh, you can or you can the microwaves you can the microwave you need for stabilizing the comb mm -hmm. that what you mean you can also generate internally from the from the optical signal transfer transfer method that allows it okay this is um, yeah I think just a, a nice piece of recent uh, of recent uh, technology development. Um, in the interest of time, I'm, I'm skipping the, fre the frequency <coughs> comb, which is also a very nice uh, piece of development, but already honored with the Nobel Prize in 2005. Uh, uh, so please uh, come, come later to me, ask questions if you want, if you want to know the details. I will now switch uh, back to the, to the atomic physics. Um, and uh, um, I've shown you some level schemes uh, already. Um, but I should uh, uh, explain a little bit what kind of, of, of transitions we are using uh, we are using for the clocks. Um, it will always the interest is always the the, cl the transition has to be narrow. That is, the excited state must be must be long lived. So it is what historically uh, in the spectroscopy people have called um, forbidden transitions. Forbidden because the light would not appear in the emission spectrum of a discharge or so, where one would only see the dipole transitions. And of course, you know it is related to the selection rules, to the to the angular momentum. Uh, the photon carries the emitted photon carries an angular momentum of one uh, or two or three or higher, but but never zero. And if the atomic transition connects two uh, levels with electronic angular momentum J and J uh, dagger, uh, there is this triangular relation that the difference of J and J dagger must be smaller than the, than the order of the photon and, and this must be smaller than the sum. And this gives this classification that the lowest order L equal one is a dipole radiation allowed for this types of transitions, L equals two would be quadrupole transitions for this type of, of delta J, L equals three octopole and so on. And you see the lower data, delta J, one plus minus one is allowed for all the processes, but the bigger delta J is only allowed for the higher uh, orders of, uh, of the radiation field. And now you can look up uh, classical electrodynamics uh, uh, in the, the Jackson uh, electrodynamics ex explains this very nicely. For example, on the radiative power uh, of an antenna, uh, in, as a function of the of the of the multipole order of the of the radiation field, it depends on the on the on the ratio of the size of the antenna to the to the wavelengths. You know, an, an, an antenna is maximally efficient if it's if the size is comparable to the wavelengths, and uh, and uh, <laughs> this factor enters <laughs> to the power uh, of 2L, where L is the multipole uh, of the multipole uh, radiation. So uh, a small antenna is always less efficient, but the problem becomes especially severe if the wavelength is long. Um, yeah, if the uh, sorry, <laughs> if the if the multipole order is high. So, because the small factor, which for visible light, comparing an atom atomic side to the wavelengths of visible light, we have a factor of 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 3, to 2 to, to 3. But if you, if you put this to a 2L, where L is a, a bigger number, 2 or 3, mm -hmm. then the power becomes very, very small, and it means the lifetime for radiation from the excited state becomes long. Mm -hmm. From one order of uh, multiple order to the next, <coughs> it is like 4 to 6 orders of magnitude suppression. <coughs> And we can nicely see this in the lifetimes of the um, of the different multiple orders. So if you if you just know uh, the dipole decay, typical dipole transition in the optical is like a nanosecond or so microsecond lifetime. If you go to the quadrupole, it's milliseconds to seconds. If you go even higher to octopole, it will be hours to months. Um, so it's not exotic to find such such long lifetimes, but you see already quadrupole brings us into the range of seconds, so, so, so the Hertz level line. 
And indeed, you can, you can see this very nicely in this ytterbium ion that I've spoken about al already. It, uh, it is unique in that it has all the three lowest dipole, quadrupole in one atom. So there is excited P state, uh, and below it is a D state, delta J equals 2 to the ground state, mm -hmm. and even an F state, delta J equals 3 to the ground state. And so lifetimes, um, nanoseconds for the dipole, 50 milliseconds for the quadrupole, six years for the octopole, one of the longest living states in the, in the atomic physics. Um, so this is uh, one type of transition. So people have been using ex extensively uh, quadrupole transitions. They appear in mercury. I've shown you already terbium, strontium plus. It's mainly, it's mainly the ions. In the neutrals, they are not so common. In the, <coughs> in the neutrals, in, if, if instead of, you know, you know, rubidium, you know, cesium or so, basically single electron S to P, but the D levels are above the, the, the P state, <coughs> so there these forbidden transitions do not exist. But they exist in the ions. But the, but the neutrals have the other ones. They have these zero to zero, and this is, the, this is a very interesting class. Uh, and this again, the one that is also appearing in, in the ions, in aluminum, in indium. Mm -hmm. uh, this one again was Demel's uh, proposal to use this again, forbidden by selection rules, um, but uh, but forbidden uh, to an, in even a different uh, in a different degree. Two electron systems, strontium, uh, two electron systems. So the two electrons can can couple to vanishing uh, total mm -hmm. angular momentum j equals zero in the ground state. Uh, and then the same happens in the triplet state. The two spins are, uh, are aligned. They add up to one. But again, now the spin and the angular momentum can add to, to z j equals zero in the excited <coughs> state. And it means that the two lowest levels both have, uh, have, um, have j equals zero. That is, they are not only they should not only be dipole forbidden, they should also be forbidden for the higher multiple orders because uh, the excited state here, if it, if it wants to emit a photon, the photon will carry at least one unit of angular momentum, but it's just not there. So the, uh, so, uh, the lowest order, how this level could decay, would be a two photon uh, transition with two photons uh, emitted. Um, uh, so that angular momentum is conserved, shared between the two photons. <coughs> but since this is singlet S, triplet P, um, the parity is different between the two states. So it, is, it, it would not be an electric dipole two-photon transition, but it would be an electric dipole plus a magnetic dipole, really some quite exotic process. And that's why these levels could can be very, very long-lived. In strontium-87, it appears because the electron spin is zero, but, the n but there is a nuclear spin. The nuclear spin leads to some uh, mixing of the, uh, of the levels, and it induces an electric dipole. Uh, but why is a nuclear spin? And so it is a very weak dipole, mm -hmm. has, uh, has a lifetime of about 100 seconds, uh, ideally in the range that we would like for the, uh, for the narrow clock transition. And this type of transition exists yeah, in, in all the two electron systems, strontium, uh, 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 aluminum, uh, plus ion, and so on. It is, um, I think I have it on the slide here. Yeah, uh, some, there is, uh, I think it's really, can, and there's some interesting physics behind it. It's, it's one quite fundamental about the angular momentum mm -hmm. uh, conservation. Um, uh, I mentioned or I explained already why is it why is it nice for a, for a clock um, because the two states <laughs> still have a very high symmetry so the the, the the angular momenta are close to zero it's nearly spherical uh, symmetric so they are not for example not very easily perturbed or polarized by external fields which reduces a possible class of uh, of, uh, of shifts and. Um, and this is also something I find I find really uh, really interesting, uh, an interesting connection. So the um, the conservation of, uh, of of angular momentum is of course linked 
to the to the symmetry of of of, of, of space, so that uh, to the rotational uh, rotational symmetry of space. Um, if the rotational symmetry is broken, then uh, conservation of angular momentum is also not no longer perfectly fulfilled. And you can say that in the in the case of the nuclear spin, the uh, the orientation of the nuclear spin creates a magnetic field and breaks the the rotational symmetry. But uh, it's interesting, and this is something that people understood only like 20 years later or so after after Demel's proposal, mm -hmm. that you can do the same thing with an external magnetic field. You, you just apply a strong external magnetic field. Mm -hmm. Again, it breaks the uh, it breaks the rotational symmetry, and it leads to a violation mm -hmm. of this otherwise very rigid uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, selection rule. And it is funny in that sense that, that now you, you have like with the strength of the electric field, you can select the strength of this transition. So you can make it weaker or, or stronger as you like. But unfortunately, <laughs> the, the field strengths that are required are quite high. You can imagine um, they should be comparable to the, to the field seen by the electron from the nucleus, from the nuclear mag ma uh, magnetic moment. So they are in the range of, of a Tesla or so. And so, and so that's why it is not not so many people are using this uh, idea. It also means that for this for the lattice clocks, um, which are all based on this uh, on the zero to zero transitions, uh, there is uh, some variety and different uh, uh, and different classes. So it can be done with with both this fermionic and bosonic. I did not. Um, so this is strontium eighty seven. It is. Uh, it is a fermionic isotope because the nuclear spin is a half integer, and it is induced by the uh, by the interaction with the nuclear spin. There is an even isotope, strontium-88. Nuclear spin would be zero. Electron spin is zero, so that's a boson, and uh, so one has a choice of both fermions and bosons, and of <laughs> inducing this transition either with the external magnetic field or with the internal magnetic field. And there is some some considerations because if you think about the optical lattice, and I've explained already that the lattice in, in, in the one D lattice it's not unity oc occupancy, but there may be the, but there may be a number of atoms in one lattice site, and uh, and so if it is bosons they may collide, and if it's fermions, uh, the the suppression of, of S wave collisions, uh, sorry, the, the suppression of of the, of, of the higher uh, of, of the P wave collisions. Um, no, all collisions are suppressed. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. For for identical fermions, for polarized identical fermions, all collisions are suppressed. Mm -hmm. So it, it one can imagine that that even with many atoms on the side, the collisions would be uh, would be suppressed, and that's why there is an interest also in uh, investigating um, fermionic geometry in one D or bosonic mm -hmm. uh, geometry possibly in in three D uh, in a single occupancy. So again. Um, Bosonic in the in isotopes without nuclear spin, uh, could the transition <laughs> could be induced by the external field. One could go to a 3D lattice with one atom per side. Uh, or the fermionic uh, isotope, one could go to a 1D lattice and hope for the S-wave suppression of the collisions. And the interactions between the atoms are still relevant and uh, I uh, I've shown you. I've here some some uh, data from from a, from a very recent paper, just just to give you a flavor to show the to show the effects. This is from the group of Yonier, who for the first time has studied um, uh, uh, a lattice clock, a fermionic lattice clock, and has systematically studied the effect of the single, doubly, and so on occupancy of the individual lattice li lattice sites on the clock. Because the um, having more than single atom occupancy in one side, of course, now one has to take the the interaction between the atoms into account, and it means it will be a shift of the levels. Mm -hmm. And if you and if you do precision spectroscopy and read this out via mm -hmm. via spectroscopy, one may see a frequency difference between the sites that are just singly occupied and the sites um, that are doubly uh, occupied. In his case, he used they used um, strontium eighty seven, exactly the level scheme I've just shown you, 
but they used uh, unpolarized fermions, uh, so the, the nuclear spin is 9 half, so there is 10 m sublevels, and of course the, the atoms uh, are distinguishable by their m by their n quantum numbers. So Pauli principle mm -hmm. still allows occupancy up to 10 uh, in one side uh, with a distribution <laughs> over all the m sublevels. That's why he is speaking here mm -hmm. about a 10 spin mixture. So he uh, uh, he can he, he he is pointing. They are pointing to this that one can really create different atom numbers. And um, he's looking at the dynamics and all the things, but I just wanted briefly to, to show you this, uh, this spectrum here, because here you can see this is uh, the zero to zero transition is driven uh, uh, with a narrow laser. And uh, the, uh, the spectrum is taken for, for, for different occupancies of the lattice. You can see the one n equals one, single occupancy, mm -hmm. uh, a line at the zero unperturbed frequency, and then as soon as there is two atoms, three atoms, four atoms, one sees significant uh, line shifts. There is always two features, plus and minus. This is the orbital. Uh, this is a parity of the orbital wave function in the uh, in the excited state, <laughs> which can uh, which can have both values. So they are interested now in studying this as a, as a coupled uh, quantum system, and in it, is a, it is a nice tool of, of studying the interaction between the, between the fermions, because, because you can really measure very precisely spectroscopically the interaction strengths shown up here as a, uh, as a level shift. Um, but, you can, uh, but you can also see that, uh, uh, that, of course, the shift here for the two-atom transition mm -hmm. Would uh, would depend, of course, also on the on the lattice potential, on the on the average distance between the atoms. So it would no it would no longer be a universal mm -hmm. parameter that would uh, that you would like for the operation of a universal clock. I think the, we discussed the question yesterday already. Mm -hmm. But in but in a setup like this, of course, you could you can really you could really select the the n equals one as the uh, as the unperturbed sides. Uh, and now you see, aha, uh -huh, it is similar. You are you are somewhat in an analogous situation to the, to the trapped ions. You have just a single uh, atom per side, but of course here you can, have, you can have very many of those traps in, in, in one setup. I'm not sure and, uh, if, if, this is, if this one, if this system is, is really going to be a, a, a very good clock because uh, the, the preparation of this, of this state, of course, takes time, he's, it, is a, it is basically he has <coughs> a, to produce a degenerate Fermi gas loaded into this letter and so on. Mm. Uh, but it is a, but in, in any case, it's, it is really an interesting physical system to, um, to study. Uh, an aside, and maybe yeah, that's, a, that's a question close to the, to the end of the, of the, of the lecture. Mm. Uh, what, about, what about interactions between trapped ions? In a, in a, linear, in a linear trap, uh, one may linear pole trap along this axis, one may easily also have like not a single but 30 or so uh, ions, what's, what's called a Coulomb crystal, mm. uh, and we can, one could collectively cool them to the, to the quantum ground state of, the, uh, um, of this uh, combined uh, electrostatic system. What, what about interactions in this in this case, do we, do we have to worry? Do you, you have some, some feeling of what would happen? It, 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 it could be a quantum system. And again, is there, in, is there interesting quantum, quantum effects? Um, you have a proposal? For for the interaction, do do we have to do, do we have to take quantum inter effects like 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 I've spoken about bosons and fermions or so? Do we have to take it into account here? Or? Yeah. Right. But that then that's the essential that's the essential argument. So the 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 all the interaction here is dominated is really dominated by the by the Coulomb. The distance between them is uh, is a f is a few microns. And so even if, it, even if everything would be in the ground state, and if you would, if you would not scatter photon, there would be, there would be basically no, uh, tunneling would be extremely weak and, and there would be no quantum phases. Uh, 
uh, so tunneling and the effects of the, of the quantum statistics are un unnegligible. Of course, one in order to observe quantum coherence, one, one would have to stop the, the light scattering that, that one, one is doing here, because the light scattering, we can e immediately identify the, the, the individual particle. But even in the dark, uh, there would be very little inter interaction. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's less exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, one is back to a completely classical uh, situation. Uh, at, at first guess, one, one would maybe uh, think that there should be a strong electrical interaction, but it's also not the case, because in a, in a simply, in a completely electrostatic uh, configuration, the ions are sitting in their equilibrium position simply there where the field is zero, the, the electric field. If the, if the electric field would not be zero, the ions would just start, start to move. So, so they are all field-free, um, but what remains uh, between the ions is an, is an electric field gradient. This is not compensated. Uh, uh, that's, a, that's a tensorial interaction. It is on the order of, like for this micron scale, it's on the order of 10 to the 7 volt per meter square or so. It sounds like a big number, but if, uh, if, you, if one expresses it's in volt per millimeter, it's, then it's 10 to the 1, 10 volt per millimeter square or so. And it, it leads, in fact, to a shift that would have to be taken into account in such a, in such a clock. Uh, because uh, in cases where there is an electric quadrupole <coughs> moment of the, of the atomic states, uh, it's the, the, the field gradient will interact with a non-spherical charge distribution in the atom. It, it, it will produce a, a, a shift that would be one of the systematics in, a, uh, in, the, uh, in the ion trap. Okay, this, uh, this is all about the... Uh, the Preparations and the uh, and the interactions. Um, um, yeah, no, maybe I should ask for questions. That's at this point, uh, please. <coughs> you mean an influence? You mean an influence of gravity on the on the trapped particles? For the for the ions, it's uh, for the ions, it's really completely. Uh, negligible, and I think for the lattices, it's also uh, the uh, these are lattices. So the, the the oscillation frequencies in the lattice are at least selected to be like ten kilohertz scale or so. And, and, and at this point, the gravitational pull is very small. You cannot say it's less. You cannot say it's less forbidden. So uh, it is. It is really different. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then I, I understand your point. I'm. I'm uh, <laughs> myself. I'm saying it was less. <laughs> it was less forbidden. To uh, it was more. Th that this one is, is more strongly forbidden. Um, and then the ytterbium really just uh, the problem of the higher order multipole uh, radiation problem. Here, the problem of the, of the conservation of, uh, of, of angular momentum. Mm -hmm. And as I said, basically, you, could, you can somehow tune the parameters. So mm -hmm. that, it, that it is 100 seconds here is really mm -hmm. determined by the, by the strength of the, of the interaction with the, uh, with the nuclear magnetic moment. And what the nuclear magnetic moment basically d does, it is mixes the, the J values here. So the, that is, this is not a J equals zero perfect eigenstate, but there is some J equals one admixture. Uh, and so the, it, it, it depends overall the J equals one state. This one should also be forbidden to the ground state because it's triplet, it's triplet to singlet. It would be intercombination <coughs> forbidden, but it is a heavy atom, so it's relatively allowed. It's 20 microseconds only. So it, de it depends, this number depends on this also on the splitting between these levels. It depends on this. And so it is somewhat, this is not so universally predictable. It can be in an, in an other atom of different magnetic moment of similar mm. mass. It could be quite different. And, but if this nuclear interaction would be, would be switched off, then the lifetime again would be, would immediately go to the, I don't know, to months or, uh, or, 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 or longer, longer times. Then there would be this, 
two photon process would be setting in. The terbium, um, the terbium is, is again, one, one has to look at, yeah, there is a little bit more of, of atomic structure to look at. Um, the, one has to look at the small print here. So the, the, gr the ground state is a 4F, 14, 6S, so it is, this is a, a rare earth, so the, the, the F shell in the ground state mm -hmm. is completely filled and there is just one 6S, elect one s outer electron in the 6S, mm -hmm. which makes it alkali-like. All these transitions here are 4F, 6P, so something happens to this outer valence electron. This one is different, so it's 4F, 13, 6S, 2. Mm -hmm. So the, in this transition, the, um, the uh, F shell is opened and one of the 4F electrons is promoted to the 6S. Mm -hmm. And um, um, this gives this somewhat a protected uh, special configuration because the 4F are much closer to the nucleus than the 6S. Mm -hmm. So this hole is quite close to the, to the nucleus and it is protected now mm -hmm. or shielded by the, mm -hmm. uh, by the two uh, spherically by the filled 6S uh, shell mm -hmm. and that's what makes this matrix element small. It, it's rather, it, it's rather hand-waving. This, this number comes, comes from atomic structure calculations. People have, have calculated. Mm -hmm. Of course, nobody has measured it. Uh, it, uh, it would be, of course, uh, sorry. It's too long for us. <laughs> it's too long for us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it would, of course, be limited by, mm -hmm. by collisions or parasitic uh, processes. <laughs> In the case of the in the case of the strontium, I think practically mm. uh, the lifetimes are limited by by blackbody radiation pushing these these levels uh, further further up to uh, to excited state and then and then pumping it down. Okay, I explained a lot of uh, atomic structure. The, uh, the the selection rules gives the basic uh, s uh, indication of what type of process it is. Um, but to, to really determine the, the transition rate, one really has to look in, in the detail, uh, at more details of the atomic structure. This is the somewhat long answer to your <laughs> <laughs> question. Okay. Also, the reason why we can just drive transition in triple spin, because I guess how you know, I just can't uh, understand like why the spin state can also The spin they chain. This is this is due to um, the um, uh, how to say in the uh, for for the light atoms there is perfect LS coupling. Uh, so there is L is an eigen number and S and there is no interaction. And for heavy atoms this principle is more and more loosened and one comes to the JJ coupling. Mm -hmm. And if the and if the LS coupling is is becoming weaker, mm -hmm. then L and S are not perfect eigennumbers anymore, and, and, and one can mix the two, the two <coughs> systems. These are also, again, these are, these are this LS coupling, this is a, a scheme that is to, to characterize and to classify the transition, but it's, uh, and it's, it's very useful, but in a real atomic system, it may not be perfectly uh, respected. It may be, there may be uh, changes, to, uh, there may be changes to the, to the, uh, to the system. The mean, the vibration and quantum number, from the uh, uh, I showed the simple, the simple expression from the from the ratio between the the the, the red and the blue sidebands. So the ratio is directly um, the ratio one is with. Um, so one goes like uh, one goes like n, the other one goes goes like like n to the one. So the ratio gives gives this ratio, and one can determine it in the in the regime where the excitations are higher. Mm -hmm. One would simply look at the at the ratio between the carrier and the sideband. It would give the an indication of the uh, of the oscillation amplitude. Uh, and uh, so basically here you could say that 
so first zero order bezel, first order bezel. So as long as the if the amplitude would be lambda over two pi, the two would be similar height. And in the quantum regime, one looks at the asymmetry between the right bands. And uh, what's what's nice here is that you can you, you can measure this by saturating very strongly. So here the here you can this spectrum was taken with a carrier was saturated very, very strongly. So you have an, uh, here, it is an absorption probability of like 70% of the sideband, but the sideband is weak. Mm -hmm. But this was just to, to saturate these two things, and then you can measure s much more sensitive, the strength of these two weak features. This works, this is for one degree of freedom, and uh, and uh, to do so this gives you the one dimensional uh, result so if you would want to do it in 3d you have to do it you have to make sure that the trap is not spherically symmetric so that you can spectroscopically resolve the two and then you have to cool all the all the degrees of freedom and, and measure them separately it, it, it takes more time but the, but it has been done it can be it can be done uh, it's especially important for the people doing uh, doing quantum uh, information processing with trapped ions, where they really have to control all all directions. Mm -hmm. For the for the clocks, it's it's maybe somewhat a bit easier because uh, clock spectroscopy you would you would preferentially do along one direction, where you, you can point uh, the laser beam along one direction, <laughs> and so you have to see that to preferentially cool these degrees of freedom, and uh, and if there is some extra motion in the orthogonal direction, it will not hurt so much. Of course, one still needs to control it, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a ground state. It depends on the system. So uh, in the in the Eterbium, I've, I've shown you we are we are just happy with, with lamp decay, and we do not do sideband cooling. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the quantum logic aluminum uh, clock, people, people call, have to, have to cool all degrees of it. No, I, I should not say um, we are cooling all degrees of freedom, but not to the quantum regime. Uh, yeah. And uh, with, with, with Doppler cooling, with Doppler cooling in an ion trap, it, it's, it's, it's very simple. Um, if the, the Doppler laser normally is not in the resolved sideband regime, it, it, it can cover different oscillation frequencies, <laughs> and then you only have to make sure that you, that you know where the three main axes of the trap potential are in space determined by the construction of the trap. And then you have to make sure that the one cooling beam has a finite projection on all the three. And then you can be sure that you are cooling all, <coughs> all degrees of freedom. Robin? Um, you mean this tweezer <coughs> clock? It's a I think it's very uh, I think it's very interesting your new approach. I also saw the uh, saw the publication, uh, um, but I have not I have not yet looked at it in uh, in details. I think I think it's interesting. It's an interesting approach, um, but it it is of course a strong dipole trap. So there will be. There will be issues about the about the light shifts that the light shifts have, have to be uh, has to be controlled. So I gave you I gave you a picture of, of, of ex explaining the magic wavelengths, uh, and this picture is uh, uh, is reducing the light shift in a dipole trap to first order. People have are continuing to look at this, and then they see that there is also higher order contributions, which may not all be. Um, Eliminated at the same time by this by this magic wavelength scheme. So people now speak about a, um, what they call an operational magic frequency, and uh, there is there is a number of open questions. Uh, uh, so, but but this is really an, a new system, and I'm sure people will will look at it, and it's worthwhile to look at this in more detail. I did a little less than I <laughs> than I thought. I, I did not do the so much the the systematics. I will uh, I will cover a little bit of them tomorrow, and then tomorrow go towards the uh, the fundamental physics uh, tests. I had a number of discussions already. I think that's, that should be interesting also to look at the wider field of physics. Thank you.